In the last segment of organic weed management, we talked about concepts, and those concepts will be used, utilized in this segment called control measures. And we the the concept of integrated weed management. Integrated weed management is really a subset of integrated pest management, and and its its goal is to minimize economic, social, and environmental uh, uh, impacts. And at this, and uh, but while uh, uh, while providing effective weed control, so the first one we talked about in the previous segment about identification, we is uh, is one of the first steps to uh, integrated weed management. Identification and monitoring, knowing what weeds you're dealing with, allows you to understand their strengths and weaknesses, and then monitoring the field when as the as the season progresses to know what weeds are coming up what weeds are present and so that you can it can inform your decisions to to control them the next the next strategies involve prevention and prevention is uh, um, i summed it up with the word clean prevention is essentially keeping weeds out of the field in the first place and so there are some very simple um very simple effective ways to to stop weeds from ever getting into the field in the first place and these are the most cost effective methods the next step would be uh, cultural methods um, i sum these up with soil preparation and essentially what this is is creating optimal conditions that that are perfect for the crop establishing optimal conditions for the crop getting the crop to the resources first will explain will will essentially be as good a guarantee for success as you can get. Because as I indicated in the previous segment, competition is explained by who gets there first, which plant gets there first, and good cultural methods are, are the techniques that will, that will ensure that. Physical methods, also known as mechanical, these involve tillage operations. These are very significant. These are very significant in organic systems. Um, often they are the only um, um, tools that are used in organic systems. There is also biological control, a very attractive pest management approach. Um, we will see the, the opportunities and, and mostly limitations for weed control, especially in agricultural systems. And lastly, we'll be talking about chemical measures. Um, I, will not, I, won't, I will not be talking about any synthetic uh, um, um, herbicides, but I will be talking about organic herbicides, those that are, that are registered for organic use. The first step is prevention. And prevention, as I indicated, is the most cost-effective method for weed control. And they, they're often very simple, and, uh, and so people don't pay much attention to them because they seem so simple and obvious, but, but it's, it's always good to remind yourself of, of these simple techniques so that you can, you can uh, uh, prevent weeds from ever getting established. One of the methods is already in operation for you. Um, it's called the Federal Seed Act, and planting crop seeds that are weed-free um, is a very effective way of, of keeping weeds out of your field. Um, and before the Federal Seed Act, this was this is a very common way that weeds were getting spread from field to field to field because farmers would harvest their crop, set some of that crop aside and uh, uh, for, for planting next year. And if seeds, if weed seeds got included in there, they would just get spread to the next season or to the next field wherever that seed went. But the Federal Seed Act, which is part of the Agricultural Marketing Act, um, essentially ensured that that seeds that are sold on the open market have to indicate how, what percentage of the, that seed is noxious weed seed so that it will prevent weed seeds from getting spread from farm to farm or from season to season. For organic systems, uh, using weed-free manure is extremely important. This is a very common way that weeds can get, can get moved around. Farm animals are often used to, to weed uh, to graze weedy patches, you know, weedy, weedy pastures. And um, those seeds that those, those animals are eating will survive the digestive tract of those animals. Now, it's a very small percentage, and it depends on the animal. So uh, a, a, a simple stomach animal like a horse, will the seeds will survive uh, much, much, uh, a much higher percentage of the seeds will survive in a simple stomach animal, a single stomach animal like a horse. In a ruminant like a like a sh like sheep or or, or cows or goats, the, those 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 guts are very efficient at digesting plant material, especially in, even seeds. But even with those animals, there will be a certain a percentage of seeds that will survive the the gut of a uh, uh, of a ruminant. Now, those that percentage is very small. We're talking usually, you know, the numbers are are rough, but they are you know probably less than three percent. Um, but when you when you talk about a single weed plant 
capable of producing a million seeds, the uh, 3% is still quite a bit of seeds. Anyhow, so making sure that those corn, those animals are in a quarantine pen when they come from weedy places so that it clears their gut and uh, they've only been fed uh, um, weed-free uh, food and uh, the manure that comes out of that, that that goes to, to an organic farm is, uh, is something uh, that will help pr with prevention. A clean tillage and harvest equipment. This is one of those no-brainer obvious uh, tools that represents a great prevention technique. Um, but it gets over it gets overlooked quite a bit. Um, having dirt clods on, on equipment that move from field to field, um, whatever you know, whatever implements that aren't cleaned, just expect that those whatever weeds were in one field that the implement got moved to to another field, expect those weeds in that other field as well. So cleaning farm equipment and harvest equipment also is 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 an important part of prevention. Limiting weed infestations on the perimeter. So. Especially with the weeds that come from the Asteraceae family, that's the thistle family, things like you know, th like, like dandelion or or, or um, a very common weed that blows in from outside from outside a farm could be horseweed. Uh, bristly ox tongue is also Asteraceae, and those seeds blow in on a on a pappus that uh, represent uh, why this method would be very effective at, at keeping those from from getting onto the farm. Cultural practices. Our goals as farmers, as I indicated in the previous segment on concepts, it, uh, one of our goals should be to create uniform, optimal conditions for our crop. And so that means that represents, you know, no hard pan, uniform soil textures, uh, a level field so that there's no low spots or high spots. Because as in indicated earlier, weeds grow where, weeds grow where, the, where optimal conditions do not exist. So creating those conditions can actually create a very competitive crop. So how do we do that? So some of the cultural methods, uh, planting density and date. The trend has been higher densities, meaning more plants in a given area, and then planting sooner. This essentially gets the crop plant to the resources first. And as I indicated previously, that explains most of competition. We'll, we'll talk more about that, about, about that later. Crop rotation. Rotating crops from one cropping system to a different cropping system, the, the, more, the, 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 the more different the systems are, the more you break up those, those weed crop associations that I talked about before. And, uh, and rotating to a different cropping system allows you to bring in different management tools that you weren't able to use in a previous cropping system. The weed species that make up your weed seed bank, they're, they, are, they, 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 they remember, right? Remember uh, the memory and momentum they remember your past management practices. And so rotating to different cropping systems allow different management systems and the weed species that are in your seed bank won't be ready for those. Smother crops. These are usually a long-term commitment in terms of usually it's a season, it's a year often uh, where a field is dedicated to these, these smother crops. Smother crops are extremely competitive um, or have some very um, uh, unique characteristic that can, uh, that can suppress weeds, they outgrow weeds. Often smother crops are used because other tools can be used to kill weeds in these smother crops and the smother crop themselves are extremely competitive. Uh, one example I provide here is alfalfa. Alfalfa is a very stressful situation for weeds because alfalfa gets mowed every month and there are very few crop plants that can, or weed plants that can handle getting mowed every single month. And if you time irrigation properly and you time mowing properly, you can, you can very much favor the alfalfa and very much disfavor the weeds. Anyhow, anyhow so this is usually a longer term commitment. Cover crops are usually a shorter term commitment. And this is usually done at the same time that, it, that your primary crop or, or in the same season, your primary crop will be planted. Usually the cover crops are planted earlier. The idea is to plant a crop that is easier to get rid of than the weeds that would otherwise grow there. Cover crops can also add you know, soil nutrients, organic matter, and other, other sorts of other benefits that, that, can't, that can be measured in addition to, to weed control. But again, cover crops for weed control is to put a crop in there that is easier to get rid of than the weeds that would otherwise grow there. This is a, this is a clover crop, uh, cro a typical cr uh, uh, clover cover crop. Um, on the left-hand side is a, uh, is a picture of a, uh, um, a grass cover crop in a vineyard. That's a, it's an oat, it's an oat, and then there's also a legume mixed in there, a vetch. Okay, cultural methods. I talked about uh, planting sooner, planting earlier. 
So this, this, this relies on a concept called self thinning. And the idea goes like this. Essentially what you do is you plant a crop at a high density, higher than optimal density. So if the cropping system, say for example, corn requires 30, 40,000 seeds per acre, you might go 50,000 seeds. This is of course is if the seed is cheap. And the idea is that you're gonna plant a crop at a high density, allow that crop to come up, let that crop capture resources so that all resources are captured before the weeds can get there. And then what you do is you thin the crop out to its optimal density down to the 30,000, 40,000 seeds per, per acre. And then what will happen is because those crop plants are already established, whatever you thinned out, whatever, whatever you left in the field is better established and it will capture those resources. It will fill in those gaps before the weeds can get in there to take up those gaps. So that's the concept before, behind planting at a higher density, um, reaching self thinning, thinning the crop and let, allowing the crop to get there first. is uh, mechanical tillage methods. These are also considered physical methods and, um, and these are imp very important operations for, uh, for organic uh, uh, agriculture. Primary tillage is usually reserved, that, that term is usually re reserved for soil preparation. These include implements that, that do major soil um, movement uh, like rippers to break up hard pan, chisels and, 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 and uh, discs to break up dirt clods. Um, the, and so um, what I'm showing in the upper right hand corner is a moldboard plow that will fold a soil, it'll, it'll fold a, an eight inch slab of soil over on top of itself so that whatever was on the surface is now eight, eight inches down. And, uh, um, and so the, um, small seeded weed species like pig weeds or most of the most annual weed species, their seeds will not be able to survive eight inch being buried eight inches underneath a, a, an operation like this. Secondary tillage, like the uh, the rotary cultivator I have down in the lower right hand corner, these these uh, these tillage implements by definition are reserved for weed control. And uh, there's a couple examples here: sweeps, shovels, rotary hoes, harrows. These kinds of things are usually reserved for uprooting weeds. The primary way that that these operations kill weeds is by burial. For example, the moldboard plow that's in the upper right hand corner or by severing roots or dislodging root contact. All you need to do with most annual, small annual weed species that just come up, especially in the early weeks, that the early week or so, is just dislodge contact. And then what's very important after these operations is to not irrigate. Hold off on irrigation as long as you can because those small weed seedlings, they just won't be able to hang on to the next, next irrigation if you can hold off, if, if, if your crop can tolerate that. Another cultural operation might be this. So here's the moldboard plow, inverting a soil residue, burying weed seeds. Again, very effective at, at killing most small seeded weed species. Most annual species are small seeded. There's only a few that have large seeds like velvet leaf or um, uh, maybe, maybe cockleburr. But most of the other ones that we deal with in California, they're usually pretty small. And this is a very effective way. But again, remember, if you come back next year with a moldboard plow, all you're doing is taking that eight inch slab and reinverting it. So whatever was eight inches down last year is now back on the soil surface. So just realize that what you're doing is you're really mixing up the weed seed bank and just, just pay attention and think about that. Uh, double digging is a technique used in organic gardening that uh, can be used to bury weed seeds. And um, I, uh, yeah, this is, um, so rippers are often used to, uh, to break up hard pan. Um, what's very interesting about hard pan is that what created hard pan in the first place very often is tillage operations. So, <laughs> so um, it, it's, it's kind of a funny cycle, um, which is probably the, ad, the reason for the advent of, well, part of the reason for the advent and the success of no-till systems in the Midwest. No-till systems in the Midwest were adopted for soil erosion purposes from wind and, and rain. And uh, what they discovered is that they have record yields in those operations. They never really did need uh, uh, primary soil uh, pr uh, preparation. The only reason for it was to break up these hard pans, which again, were created by tillage operations. But never mind that. Uh, we're gonna go on to uh, using discs to break apart some of the large clods that might be formed by rippers or by a moldboard plow, because you're, you're going to need that, especially in high clay soils. Those big clods and those, those uneven surfaces are perfect, 
perfect environments for weed seeds and weed seedlings to become successful. Finally, making sure that your field is level is extremely important because we want to make sure that water levels, especially when we irrigate if by furrow irrigation and whatnot, there's no low spot or high spot because this is where weeds like to grow. They like to grow in those, those, un uneven, those uneven portions of your field. Trying to create optimal conditions that are perfect for the crop, making the crop as competitive as possible. Pre-irrigation and the cultivation cycle. So what I'm going to talk about here is purging the weed seed bank. Again, the strength of an annual species, which m many of our species that we deal with are annuals, is the seed. And once seed gets into soil, it is nearly impossible to kill them. So if we talk about conventional herbicides, uh, herbicides sprayed on weed seeds will not kill them. Fumigation will kill weed seeds, but, sp but just spraying herbicide on, on, on a weed seed will not kill it. It is very well protected from anything. doesn't matter what we do to it. It is very difficult. So that seed bank, we need to purge it. We need to get those seeds out of that seed bank. And the most effective way is to get them to germinate. And that's what the cycle is going to take advantage of. So pay attention to where the weed seeds are, where they probably are after each of these steps, after each of these operations. First step is you've got listed beds. Listed beds are those beds that have gotten pulled and they're, they're in straight lines, but they're still kind of cloddy and they're still, you know, there's basically just fresh soil, but you've got your basic planting lines. You've got your basic rows uh, uh, and your basic furrows established, right? We haven't done any final bed preparation, but what we're doing is we're setting it up for that first irrigation. So we'll use some irrigation, furrow irrigation or sprinkler irrigation. We need to get all the soil wet after we pulled up those beds. What will happen, of course, is if there's weed seeds in that, that soil, which there probably are, those weed seedlings near the surface will germinate. The seeds that are capable of germinating will germinate usually from the top half inch. Uh, most of them are germinating from within the top quarter inch. Very few weed seeds will germinate, be able to tolerate germinating from below two inches. So there still could be viable weed seeds below two inches in this soil. But what we're trying to do is just get those seeds near the surface to germinate and then what we're going to do, we're going to be ready for them. We're going to plow those. We're going to use a, 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 some tillage operation to basically like uh, like sweeps, shovels, a rotary cultivator, something to chop up those weed seedlings. And again, it's important to it's important to dislodge those weed seedlings, let it dry so that those weed seedlings die, and then repeat. Repeat as many times as you can afford. Right? I say three times here. If you go go if you can afford ten times, you should do it. Um, some farmers can only afford one time of doing this per season. As many times as you can afford. What's important here is you'll notice I'm using a rotary cultivator. I'm using some tillage operation, some secondary tillage implement. And what I'm doing here is we are churning up the soil. Well, that's important because we're bringing up new weed seed, right? Those weed seeds that were in, that were in step two that are two inches down, we need to bring those up. We need to bring those closer to the soil surface. We need to get them a flash of light. We need to scratch their seed coat with, the op with this tillage operation. That way, when we irrigate the next time, the water will and the seed will imbibe, it will germinate, and then we'll get them in the next. We'll get them the next time. The more you can do this, the better off you're going to be. You'll purge that weed seed bank. The most effective way to get rid of that you have control over to get to, to get rid of the weed seed bank, which is the secret weapon of of, of annuals. So on that last cycle. Important on that last cycle is we're entering the last cycle right now. Okay, so we've we've we, we've we've rotary we, we, we rotary cultivated. Um, we've uh, the weed seedlings we've irrigated. The new set of weed seedlings are going to pop up, right? So we could cultivate with a bed shaper, take those weed seed seedlings out, or um, what we could do is, and then what we can do is come in. So this is going to be final bed preparation. It's going to be smooth. It's going to be ready for the planter. And then we're going to irrigate again, right? But remember, so the bed shaper is going to churn up some soil. There's going to still be some weed seedlings in there and uh, or weed seeds that are viable. And we're going to need to take care of those. So we're going to irrigate that final bed that's nice and smooth, ready for the planting lime. And then we're going to use a, a herbicide. I'll talk about some organic herbicides later or flame or steam. And I'll talk about these later, right? You will get those last set of seedlings. What's super important after you do this step is to don't do anything, don't disturb the soil after that. Anytime you disturb the soil, you're bringing new weed seeds. So you're, you're, this, is, this is where we're at right now. 
So what we're going to do is we're going to let that bed dry. We've taken out the weed seedlings, right, with our with our herbicide, our flame, or our, our steam, and we're going to let those weed seeds, we're just going to let those weed seeds that are near the soil surface, we're just going to let them sit. There are some viable weed seeds that are deep. They're so deep they won't germinate. They know they're deep. They won't germinate. They're measuring temperature fluctuations. They're measuring daylight, uh, flash, of, flash of light. Uh, uh, sometimes CO2, O2 levels can also be an indicator to seeds that, that they're too deep, but they won't germinate. The ones on the surface won't germinate because it's too dry. We're allowing that top surface to dry. We call that a dry mulch layer. That dry mulch layer, essentially, we're going to take advantage of the moisture that's two inches down and deeper because it's going to start percolating. It's going to start drying out. All right. Weed seeds will not germinate from more than two inches down or very, very rarely will they be able to make it. They just don't have the reserves. They're too small. What we're going to do next is we're going to use a planter and we're going to basically split the bed top and, uh, and, and, plant, and plant our crop seed. All right. So now realize that this planter might disturb the soil a little bit, it might disturb it enough where we put viable, we uh, viable weed seeds uh, close enough to moisture where they might germinate. So it, you might be required to go through this planting line and take out, uh, by hand weeding, take out the weeds that might be growing in the planting line. What's important is to not disturb any of the dry soil that's on the top, right? So this planter is going to dig down deep in two inches down and plant that crop seed. Now, the crop seed, when we plant that crop seed, we have to plant it into moisture if that crop seed is small. There are techniques to try to artificially create a, a larger crop seed, like for example, um, um, they can be clay impregnated, right? So coated seed um, or, or um, can actually give you a better soil contact. Uh, sometimes uh, seed priming will give a, give a crop seed a head start. But essentially, just realize by disturbing this, this bed top, you might have to d deal with those weeds. Another technique we can do to get the crop there first is we can take advantage of the So, for example, if we have large seeded crops like corn, beans, squash, things like that, we can directly plant those seeds really deep into the soil. We can plant those four inches deep into the soil, well down into the moisture, well below where the viable weed seeds are uh, that are that are sitting in dry soil, not capable of germinating, but down to where the viable seeds are that are not capable because it's too deep. But these large crop species are capable of germinating from four inches down and making it. Another way to artificially have a larger crop that we're planting is to use a transplant. And we're going to transplant that, that we'll put the transplant down into moisture and that way the crop has a head start. And so that's another technique that, that gives a competitive advantage to the crop. And you'll notice here, so there's moist soil, it's deep down, dry soils on the top, it's too dry for any viable weed seeds to germinate, and, uh, and the, and the, and the weed, viable weed seeds in the moist soil are too deep, they won't make it, they know it. Uh, planting into moisture, so what you do is essentially you get these plants to come up, uh, you, you're maintaining that dry soil layer, you're letting the moisture drop deeper and deeper by percolation, and uh, once you have a dry layer that forms over the top of the bed, what will happen is very little water will actually evaporate through that dry layer, right? Dry soil represents almost an infinite resistance to, 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 to moisture evaporation. So the most of that loss will be from the plant, the crop plant, drawing moisture out of that wet soil and also percolation, gravity, the water percolating down from there. Meanwhile, that dry soil layer is preventing those seeds, from, those weed seeds that are viable from germinating and, uh, and, and you hold off as long as you can. As long as the crop can tolerate it, watch them, follow the, the evapotranspiration and the, and the water status of your crop plants. You will have to irrigate. You can irrigate where you can sub, you can sub that moisture across the beds and not get the top of the bed wet because as soon as you get the top of the, wet, the bed wet, those viable weed seeds that are in that dry dirt layer, they're going to germinate, right? Hold off as long as you can. Eventually, what will happen is the bed top will get wet. Eventually, you know, those things, those weed seeds will get exposed to moisture. And when they do, they're going to pop up. But the crop is so well established that it's going to be very competitive against those weed seeds. Another thing about having those crops established and fully, fully, uh, fully out of the ground is that they'll be able to tolerate some tillage operations like a rotary cultivator that you can use soil that you pile up around the sides of those crop plants. Meanwhile, the weeds are so small, they can't tolerate any kind of soil disturbance and they'll basically get buried. They'll get dislodged. 
you let it dry, you don't irrigate right away after doing this. The crop plant's going to tolerate that soil being piled up against it. Weed seeds are going to dry and die, and very effective at taking out these, the, the, those weed seeds. You will have to irrigate again. Those bed tops will get wet again. You've pulled up some new weed seeds that are viable. But the thing is, is that the crop is getting so well established. It's so competitive that those crops can tolerate beds getting torn down, beds getting built up, beds getting torn down, etc., etc. Meanwhile, the weed seeds are just caught in a stage where they just can't make it. They're too small. There are several other options you can use in organic systems on that last irrigation cycle. Remember the purging the weed seed banks, so you irrigate those beds. One option is to use uh, lay down solarizing plastic. And I'll talk more about this. This is the beginning of, the, of, of, of solarization. Um, you can also, um, I talked about using a bed shaper, right? As your final, as your final cult cultivation. If the bed shaper is very shallow in its tillage, you only have to worry about a small amount of weed seeds that got moved up. Another option, and, I, and we talked about this also, about using a herbicide, flame, or steam. Let's start with the plastic. Let's start with solarization. Um, well, I'm sorry, with, with flaming and steaming. So flaming and steaming can be a very effective way at, at, at killing weed seeds, especially, especially uh, um, small ones. So um, if it's an established weed, forget it. Um, these, these techniques, do they're just not capable of killing enough cells because that's what the steam and the flame is doing. And they're plasmalizing, they're exploding the cells. And you're trying to explode enough cells where the plant can't recover. So it's only good for seedlings and it's only good for young succulent plants that, that basically essentially get cooked. You don't need to cook these plants to a black crisp. All you need to do is just run the steam over the top of them where they, they take on a different hue. And you can tell, you can see what their, their color is going to change. And immediately, within, within 15 minutes, you're going to see these plants start to wilt. And, they'll, and that's when you know you've got enough of them. But the plants have to be small. Um, you can kill surface weed seeds with these with uh, steaming or flaming, but it takes it takes more heat. Uh, many weed seeds can tolerate a, a pretty impressive amount of heat. All you need to do to know understand that is look at wildfires. Look at how much how many how many plants come up, how many annual exotic grasses come up after a wildfire the following year in the winter time. There is a certain amount of seeds that will survive even a direct flame. Um, so, so to kill weed seeds on the surface, you need, you need quite a bit, you need quite a bit of energy and quite a bit of heat, but it can be done. And there was, there's been some very successful steaming, um, treatments that, uh, Steve Fenimore at UC Extension in Salinas has been doing, has been very impressive at, uh, at, at killing weed seeds. And this is a sub, this is a subsurface steaming treatment that does, that does a very good job. These, these techniques can be very energy intensive, um, as you can imagine, um, you, you don't, you, you, you're not moving very fast, um, um, but they're organic. Solarization. Solarization, I mentioned um, laying down clear plastic. The plastic has to be clear. Black plastic will not kill weeds uh, except for their lack of photosynthesis. So, um, you, um, you know, so if you use black plastic, you're just snuffing out light. The, the heat generated underneath black plastic will not likely kill weed seeds or weed seedlings unless they're in darkness for a long enough period of time. Clear plastic, on the other hand, is very capable of cooking weed seeds and also cooking weed seedlings. So the, the clear plastic is the, the most effective is a three mil. Anything thinner is uh, easy to rip and also doesn't, doesn't allow enough of a one-way door greenhouse effect that the, green, that the solarization is, is utilizing to kill weed seeds. It's important to seal the edges of this, this, this clear plastic. It's also important that the bed is wet. So laying down uh, buried drip tape or having, um, or having a, a, a emitters or something on the surface that keeps that bed wet is a very important part of the kill process in, in, with solarization. How long do you need? It depends. Depends on what time of year. What's the solar angle? June 21st is best. That, unfortunately, that's usually the middle of the growing season. So if you go earlier, you need longer periods of time. If you're in the winter time, the solar angle is so steep that it's not very effective at killing weed seeds and, and, and even weed seedlings. But again, seal off the edges. The dirt clods that, that are on top of the bed are, will form enough of a gap between the soil and the plastic to create, a, to create a perfect solarizing greenhouse effect. 
And that's what you're looking for, a little bit of a gap, wet soils, wet soils, the wet heat kills better, and also it's black, or it's dark soils are, when they're wet or dark, they absorb more heat, and it's a much more effective killing power, all right? So these, are, these should be reserved for some pretty expensive crops um, where conventional herbicides can't be used. They are organic. Uh, um, they, they, they are also effective in sensitive urban areas. Um, they are organic except for the plastic. Um, there are recycling um, services provided for these things. And um, so, but, but still, you're still dealing with plastic. So with wet soil here in this this particular this particular graph right here, what you're seeing here is you're seeing the soil and the on the on the y-axis you see the soil surface is at zero centimeters, and then you see 18 centimeters down here at the bottom of the y-axis, and on the x-axis is the temperature, and the walk away message with this is that in wet soils, high temperatures that you might ex that you might expect 160 degrees, 155 degrees under solarizing plastic penetrates deeper into soils that are wet compared to soils that are dry. Dry soil is a great insulator. All those air pockets prevent hot temperatures from penetrating deeply, but because of the wet soils act as a great conductor, um, those high temperatures can actually get, those high temperatures can get to be, uh, can, go, can go much deeper. Those high temperatures, you're looking for about 150 degrees Fahrenheit in order to kill weed seeds. Purslane is a great indicator species, and that's the one that, uh, uh, that's, that, that's a, it's a great indicator species. You kill that, you're killing most of the other ones that you care about. And so obviously wet soils are the ones you want. Anything lower than 130 degrees for a short period of time um, is not gonna kill weed seeds or weed seedlings. So duration and intensity, those two are very important. Um, um, so timeline, it's probably, it's probably at least a, f a couple weeks. Um, and the closer to June you can get, the better, the better kill, kill rate you're gonna get. So um, putting moisture to where the crop is, you know, this is, so having buried drip tape, this is especially important for uh, solarization or, 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 putting the, or putting drip tape on the surface. That's just keeping the bed wet is extremely important. But this, the, the, the point of this slide is to, to essentially putting moisture where the crop is getting that drip tape and getting, getting those emitters where, wherever the crop is going to be and making sure that's where moisture is, when and where the crop is. Okay, so another technique, this conservation tillage is really a hybrid between uh, a no-till system and, uh, and a tillage system. So I call it a hybrid system, right? So, so follow me here on this, and this is, this is all about what gets disturbed, what doesn't get disturbed, using a cover crop and uh, taking advantage of, of uh, where the weeds are and where, where the crop plants are. So you'll notice here in this, this, top, this, this top cartoon is, you'll notice the old stubble from last year. So that's the old crop stubble that got harvested last year. You'll notice that there's a bunch of uh, residue that's a chopped up crop after the crop got taken off and the crop got mowed. You'll see a lot of the residue stored off into the side here. And then that's where you might have a side dressing, a manure for an organic system. You might lay that down. You'll also notice here there's a cover crop that's, that's planted that will grow through the residue. And, um, and so that'll help stabilize the residue, keep it from blowing away or washing away. And so then in the next step, what happens is when you plant the crop, you might lay down a band fertilizer with that crop seed. But in the process of planting that seed, you chopped off the bed top right here. And so when you chop off that bed top, you'll chop up the cover crop, um, uh, throw it down with that, with that, with where the residue was. And essentially you've got that whole side of the bed buried under residue and chopped up cover crop, which is now a dying mulch. And uh, you created this, uh, uh, this, this bare bed top up here. Um, so that got cut by the planter. Uh, the residue reduces erosion, both by wind and water and the bed top net tends to be a little bit warmer which is what you want for the crop to develop. Next stage, as a crop emerges, you'll have that bare ground. That's uh, where the planter cut into it. And uh, crop gets established. You'll take that residue and chop mulch and pull it up with a cultivator, pull it up over around the base of the crop plant. And uh, you've got yourself some pretty effective weed control. So you'll see this is a combination of, of a no-till system as well as, or, uh, 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 as, well as a, a tilled system. So a reduced tillage system called ridge, ridge tillage. 
For physical methods, hand weeding is still one of the most common weed uh, control measures worldwide. Uh, not so much in America. It's still relatively common in, in expensive organic fields uh, in, in the U.S. Uh, but these are just the most common ones. One of my favorite is this push-pull hoe right here. It's also, the, I guess the brand name is called the hula hoe. But I've, I have many, many days, years of uh, hula hoeing in some of my experiments when I was, when I was, uh, uh, when I was, um, I guess not a professor. <laughs> so um, keep these tools sharp. Um, having a file on hand is important. Um, if you just chop off right at soil line, it is not effective. A lot of those weeds will recover from that, especially if you didn't get that very first node. Weeds are very good at having a node that might be hidden up just below ground from you. Um, and for perennials, this is almost a useless technique, um, um, but, uh, but it can be very effective for, for weed seedlings of annuals. Biological control um, is not uh, the greatest method in, in, in agriculture. Um, classical biocontrol is where essentially what we do is we have a weed. It often comes from a different country. We go back to that country. We find what's feeding on it and keeping it in control and keeping it from being a, a keeping it from being a weed. So, for example, yellow star thistle is not native to California. It's native to the Mediterranean. If we go back to the Mediterranean, we will find this particular organism, the, the, the peacock fly, the false peacock fly, that feeds on its flowers. It lays eggs in its flowers and the larvae feed through the flower, eat all the seeds, and, it's, and it's, it keeps it in check. So we bring those going through a very controlled program that USDA runs through APHIS, Animal Plant Health and Inspection Service. This, uh, these organisms are reared. They are tested to be sure they don't, they don't uh, feed on California natives. And then they're brought back to California and then released. Um, these methods are not very good in California because they tend to be very species specific. Most conventional growers have upwards of 95% weed control op um, options at very relatively low cost. Um, these biocontrol organisms will never get below a, a two or three percent, like most conventional herbicides can. So there, so there's very few examples, very few effective examples. Uh, in conventional agriculture and, ag and, and ag organic agriculture. Again, these organisms are very species specific. The best ones are very species specific. And so we very rarely have the perfect combinations where the biocontrol organism will eat the weed or feed on the weed and, the, and not feed on the crop. So there's, there are very no, no good examples of biocontrol in, in agriculture. The other problem is, is that you'll see here on the right hand side, um, the, the, the economic threshold is where the abundance of weeds that cause yield loss, the amount of yield loss, there's a cost associated with that. When the cost of the yield loss equals the cost of the available weed control, then that's the economic threshold. So how many weeds need to be present for you to justify paying the price of doing weed control? You'll see the economic threshold for conventional systems is down around three, two, four, five percent somewhere in there. Whereas with organic systems, it tends to be a little bit higher um, because the because the, the costs aren't as great and there's a much more tolerance for, uh, for uh, there there's often more tolerance for weeds and the lack of available effective weed control in organic systems. You see, chemical methods can be can be very effective and uh, conventional systems they uh, they benefit from these long term these long-term uh, uh, pest re um, suppression, but, um, but those, those benefits um, have costs associated with them too. Organic growers don't have many of these options. Biological control could be broad spectrum using animals uh, to basically eat anything that's on, uh, the, 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 to, to eat uh, weeds. Um, there are very few examples of selective broad spectrum control using grazing animals. Um, for example, using sheep or goats or even cows uh, in an orchard or a vineyard system. Those, those, those ruminant animals will basically, they'll eat everything. They'll start eating fence posts if, if allowed to. Um, um, so there's, there's no selectivity there. Um, but you could, there are certain animals that can be trained, that can eat certain things. Like cattle can actually be trained to eat certain vegetation, but it's 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 pretty labor intensive because the cows have to feed only on that weed species, and then they're released into a mixed system of desirable crops with a or desirable system with a non with a weedy system. But it's 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 quite uh, it's quite labor intensive. 
Um, like I said, sheep, goats will eat just about, uh, just about anything. Um, there are feeder geese that can actually be relatively selective on grasses. So those, uh, that, that's, a, that's a form of selective broad spectrum. The, the advent of automated weeders because of our lack of labor, especially in California, has made these tools very efficient and very good. They're getting down to that, that 5% uh, um, weed cover that uh, conventional growers are expecting. So that conventional growers are using these automated weeders that are capturing 95% of the weeds is very promising. And, um, and these, uh, these, th this will definitely play a role in organic, um, in organic systems as well. That they're being developed in conventional systems where the expectations are 95% or better weed control is a good thing because um, for, especially for organic growers, because they, 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 these, these tools will be perfected there. And, uh, and then adopted um, um, both by, by organic growers, very effective tools. And again, they, are, um, they have to search through uh, desirable plants and undesirable plants and decide when to, when to uh, um, use these little tillage tines to take out, the, take out the weeds. Cover cropping systems. This is a cover crop that's being grown in, the, in a vineyard between the planting lines. We call those the middles. In this particular cover crop, you can see these are um, oats mixed with vetch. There's also a little bit of mustard in there. You can see adjacent plots. This is an experiment. So you can see the adjacent plots where the yellow mustard is. This particular plot has a cover crop. The cover crop is very competitive. Mustard doesn't have much of a, doesn't have much of a challenge, doesn't, can't challenge these cover crop very well. So you can see the suppression that you, that, that, that in this particular crop, right? So just to leave this cover crop in the middles for a vineyard would be disastrous for the vine when it started to when it started to to push out. These cover crops are often mowed before that happens, and this is showing you a system where uh, a mower, a flail mower, is being used as a as a green chopper to chop up the cover crop, and then the, the conveyor belt is blowing that that chopped mulch underneath the vine row. So you've got if there's no additional water in the middles, very few weeds will grow in June, July, August. Uh, and the mulch that's down the vine row is very effective at suppressing weeds uh, because it's very thick and uh, and uh, it will it will it will snuff out light to keep prevent weed seeds from being weed seedlings from popping up. This is showing you some glass uh, some uh, lawn clippings being used as a suppressive method. So how much mulch do you need? How thick does it need to be? And what kind of mulch should you use? Well, that's a complicated, that, there's a complicated answer to that. So let's answer that with how much mulch. Turns out that you need to concentrate the mulch. You can't just grow a cover crop, chop that cover crop and just let it lay where, you, where it grew. It, you will never suppress weeds enough to, uh, to, to enjoy um, um, weed suppression by the mulch effect. What it needs to be is you need to have about a three to one ratio, about 70% of the area needs to be, that needs to be growing cover crops and then that 70 percent area needs to be concentrated the mulch needs to be chopped concentrated down to 30 percent of the area to get a thick enough mulch to suppress weeds and you'll see that in the graphs that are that are presented on the right and i'll point those out so in the first year of mulching it's basically a one-to-one -one relationship it's a linear relationship wherever you have weed cover or wherever you have mulch cover is where you don't have weed cover which is why it's that negative line right there Right? So it's about a one-to-one -one relationship. Wherever mulch is, is where weeds can't be. But then in subsequent years, the mulch will hang on. It won't break down entirely. And so you'll get the benefit of that into the next year. It's a kind of a residual effect. And so then in the subsequent years, you'll start to get this curve that you see in that first, that, that top graph up there. And, um, and so that's a, really, that's a really great benefit that you see there. You need a much higher coverage in the first year to overcome this linear effect. You need to get up to 80, 70, 70 80, 90 percent mulch cover in order to get you know, um, 10, 20 percent weed cover. Um, but if you can achieve that, you can you can um, um, you can bank on the benefits later on in the later on in subsequent seasons. Um, you can get away with much less mulch because of that residual effect if the mulch doesn't break down. Mulches that are made of grass last longer than mulches that are made of broadleaves like legumes. You see this is a self-regulating system. What that means is that wherever you have a whole bunch of weeds, don't worry because those systems, because they're, they're nutritious, there's a lot of moisture, those systems are also great for growing cover crops. 
And so, so it's a self-regulating system. So if you have a, a system that, that doesn't produce very much cover crop because it's, it's dry or it's gravelly or it's, or it's poor soil conditions, don't worry. The weeds won't grow that well either. But as long as you abide by that three to one ratio and concentrate 70 to 30, uh, you can enjoy some pretty good weed suppression. Now, kind of wheat, what kind of mulch should you use? Cover crops that are, have a high C to N ratio, those who compost know what I'm talking about. These are grasses, things that have high carbon to nitrogen ratios. They will last a long period of time, whereas the ones with, with, uh, with, with, with low uh, carbon to nitrogen ratio, like legumes, um, they will not last a long time. But when you use, when you chop up the grasses, they tend to clump up and they tend to provide a little bit of light that can get through that clumping. And so that you need about 800 grams per meter square if you use a grass as a cover crop. Whereas if you use a legume as a cover crop, you don't need as much. You need half as much mulch and you can get away with 400 grams per meter squared. But the cost of that is that the legume cover crop is going to break down really fast. It won't make it through the next year. Whereas the cover crop from the grass, it will make it through the next year. So in that previous graph where you saw that residual effect, the benefit of the residual effect, most of that benefit from the later years comes from grasses. But with legumes, you can get, you can get away with much less cover than you, can, than you need with or, uh, um, grams per meter square than you, can, than you need with grasses, but they don't last as long. So again, you can't get, you, you can't get something for nothing. There's no such thing as a free lunch. Mulches are really great at suppressing broadleaf species. Mustards are, are an easy consequence. They, 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 don't, they don't do well with mulch. Grasses do really well in mulch. So grass weeds, will, where their, their, uh, their coleoptiles will push through the, the, netted, the, the netted weave of mulches and easily get through. And so grass weeds are not as well suppressed by, by mulches as broadleaf species, which come up usually as a, as a hook when they come up out of the ground. Field bindweed seems to be seems to do well in any system. It doesn't matter if it's a conventional herbicide system. It doesn't matter if it's a mulch system. Their field bindweed is probably one of our most difficult perennials to control here in California. Organic herbicides do exist. Um, there's usually by rapid death. It's usually by damage to the cuticle. So there's desiccation, drying out, or cell cell leakage. So very often they're taking advantage of soaps and, and, and surfactants that will break these, the first line of defense for these plants. They only work well on small weeds. They do not work on rhizomes because these organic herbicides do not move through the stem. They don't move throughout the plant. They only kill what usually what, what, what they come in contact with. So there's very little residual activity with these organic herbicides. They're often botanically based, which is an attractive feature to them. Uh, clove oils, eugenol, the, the uh, uh, limonene, these are uh, these 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 are attractive to organic growers. There are also soaps that uh, that also are very good at getting through cuticles um, that that represent some of the organic herbicides. And then there's of course organic uh, acetic acid, which is vinegar. But this vinegar is not table vinegar. It's not the stuff you have in your kitchen. Um, it's much more concentrated, um, twenty percent rather than. 4% that you get on your table. These are some trade name examples of organic herbicides that exist out there. So the essential plant oils, these are some of the ones that, again, have some decent contact act activity. Um, these are the orange oils. These are some of the, the brand names that have been tested. Um, UC is in um, John Ron Caroni at the University of Extension, weed specialist, is doing quite a bit of work on, the, on many of these, especially in vineyard systems especially with the, the threat to the uh, different herbicides that are because of resistance or other issues, these organic herbicides are very attractive. And then a lot of people do want to go to these, these organic herbicides. But what's important to understand is that these, these, these organic herbicides will, will do not give the 95 to, to 99 percent weed control that, that conventional growers enjoy with synth synthetic herbicides. So um, they are just a tool. Um, they are a uh, um, they they can be they they can be a, a, a nice tool in the quiver. These are a combination of methods that that exist, and so um, soaps and, and fatty acids, soaps of fatty acids and 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 other kinds of uh, compounds. So the last concept I want to uh, um, go over is timing of perennial control. 
Perennials, like I said, have rhizomes, tubers, or stolons, a modified stem that's often underground, sometimes above ground. These have large carbohydrate reserves as they come out of the winter time. And what I want you to pay attention to is that the carbohydrate reserves of those rhizomes and tubers are the secret weapon to these perennials. So when they exit the winter time, those carbohydrates are going toward new growth. And so they're being drained out of those rhizomes. They're being drained out of those stolons. They're weakening those stolons and rhizomes. This is a point at which you can attack them. And so if you don't do anything, then the plant will fully they'll put leaves out. It'll fully resume its carbohydrate um, uh, that it sends back down underground, back to those stolons, back to the tubers, back to the rhizomes, and it will enter the next winter in, at, very, uh, at very high levels. What you want to do is take advantage of its weakness right at that low point, right in the summer, t entering the summertime. If you use multiple contact or physical removal methods of the shoots, anything that's green, anything that came up out of the ground from those rhizomes or stolons, you take those off and you do that multiple times and you could starve the carbohydrates out of all those rhizomes and tubers. And if, they, if those rhizomes, tubers, and stolons go, go into the winter with low enough carbohydrate, they will die. Um, but uh, but, but it's, it's, it's a lot of effort. It's much more effective to never let those things establish in the first place. And again, there are no systemic, uh, I'm not aware of any systemic organic herbicides that could move into the plant that you might apply in the late fall or the late uh, summer, early fall that could go down to kill the rhizomes or tubers, um, but they do exist for conventional herbicides. The timing for annuals, it's pretty simple. As soon as they come up, kill them. That's the only way you can do it. Um, you will not kill ungerminated weed seeds except by very, very strong fumigation methods um, or direct heat uh, and a lot of direct heat um, like flame. Um, so the most effective is to get them to germinate and then take them out. Here are the conclusions for this segment. Do not rely on a single method for weed control. Use integrated pest management, integrated weed management. It's, it's, it's an assorted assault on, on weeds that essentially provides effective weed control that minimizes environmental, economic, and social impacts. Uh, create uniform optimal conditions for the crop. Make your crop as competitive as possible. Let the crop do, do half your job for weed management. Purge in the weed seed bank. There's nothing more important than get those weeds out of the seed bank. Those seeds represent a memory and momentum of your past management practices and your future management problems. Dry mulch, creating a dry mulch layer and planting into moisture. We talked about this during this segment. Giving your crop a head start, allowing your crop to get to the resources first before the weeds can get there. Solarization can be a very effective technique, um, but you have to follow the techniques I, I described. To clear, clear plastic, uh, solarizing, seal the edges, wet beds. Cover crop and mulches. Cover crops using crops that are easier to get rid of than the weeds that would otherwise grow, go, grow there. Um, is, is the concept behind, uh, behind that tool. Organic herbicides, they do exist. They are, um, they are limited in their ability to control weeds. And if you're used to a conventional system, the, the, those, those compounds don't exist. Um, and so, um, but, but they should be viewed as a tool. They should be used as a, as a tool, especially during the purging the weed seed bank. You know, because those weed seedlings that pop up during purging the weed seed bank and creating the dry mulch layer, those seedlings will be small and those organic herbicides will work pretty well on them. So, so it's not a tool to be, to, to be ignored.